See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. This is See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Improving the lives of everyone on the planet and the planet that is a bold moonshot and a really tough gig. Few people have the ability to see that big a picture, wrap their head around the complexities of such a massive undertaking, or tune into the fine details of what's required to achieve such an audacious goal. That's why when you find someone who not only sees the problem as a whole, but then who endeavors to intervene and innovate toward a solution, you open your ears and listen widely. Universal health coverage, although it sounds actually quite bland in a way, in fact, it means health care for everybody everywhere. And that's a massive undertaking for our world today. But nevertheless, it's possible. And it's possible because we have such a technologically developed world. And we have to have the will to do that. Meet Barbara Stilwell. She's a nurse practitioner, researcher, and health policy expert, and the executive director of Nursing Now, a three-year global campaign, program, and growing social movement working to influence national and global health policies. If it weren't for Barbara Stilwell, there might not be any nurse practitioners caring for people in Great Britain today. In the 1970s, when Barbara was working in the inner city of Birmingham, England, she found that many families, most of them from India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, had no one to consult with about matters of health promotion, like where to get their children immunized, developing healthy nutrition habits, or how to stop smoking. Barbara won a scholarship to study in the United States to become a nurse practitioner, and when she returned to the UK, she helped establish England's first training program for nurse practitioners. For the past 25 years, she's worked around the world, including with the World Health Organization and InterHealth International, in senior roles guiding and advising ministers of health on strategies for workforce solutions. And she's practiced in the underserved areas of Africa and Australasia and the Caribbean. In this episode, we discuss the role nurses play in the very ambitious United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We talk about why she sees nurses as an integral part of every and any conversation about innovating for better health outcomes. And finally, we find out how she and nurses around the globe are getting it all done through the Nursing Now Global Campaign. This is See You Now, and I'm Shauna Butler. I'm Barbara Stilwell. I'm the executive director of the Nursing Now Global Campaign. And I came to this job from a job in international development, which I'd been in for 12 years, where I had really seen the need for uh, a better, more focused health workforce that was going to be able to help us achieve universal health coverage. Um, and before that, I worked with the World Health Organization on health workforce, um, which again led me to see that the world is so short of health workers that we're very unlikely to achieve the sustainable development goals unless we do something about that. Hence my enthusiasm for nursing. You mentioned the sustainable development goals. So how is nursing tied to the sustainable development goals? So the sustainable development goals are, are very broad and ambitious. And they address not only health in its sort of purest form, but also women's health, economic development, climate. And all of these areas are areas that nursing is involved in. We know that if you develop nursing, it has a triple impact. It develops not only people's good health, but it also has an impact on 
the number of women coming into the workforce. So it helps support gender equality when women don't have opportunities and chances to work. And it also uh, supports economic development in two ways. One is through supporting women to contribute to the workforce. But secondly, and very importantly, if you don't have a healthy population, uh, you're not going to have people in work paying taxes. So improving health improves the economic outlook of any population. And so nursing has a key triple impact in that way, but it also does on other areas, uh, nutrition, healthy development for children, ending poverty, all of those things. Um, because nursing is a broad church with a, with a biopsychosocial approach to health. And the universal health coverage and the universal health access. Back in 2015, nations around the world were all in agreement. This is important. So why is it important and what happens when we achieve universal health access and coverage? Universal health coverage is critical uh, because it means exactly what it says. It's health coverage for everybody, everywhere. And we know already that there are a, a millions of people who won't ever see a health worker um, in their lives because of um, problems with distance, with uh, accessibility to somebody that will understand them, um, or with just being able to access any equipment or medicines that, that, that they might need, so problems of supply chain and so on. So universal health coverage, although it sounds actually quite um, bland in a way, because it's really meant to signify people not having a huge out-of-pocket expenses, it was built around the idea of um, health care that wasn't outrageously expensive for the poorest people. But in fact, it means health care for everybody everywhere. And if you just think about that, it's huge. Everybody, everywhere. Not 80% of the population, but everybody. And that's a massive undertaking um, for our world today, overcoming some of the challenges and simply having health workers out there. Uh, but nevertheless, it's possible. And it's possible because we have such a technologically developed world that we can do this um, if we want to do it. And, and we have to have the will to do that. There's so many different data points around why universal health coverage and access. And it dramatically lifts people out of poverty. I remember Melinda Gates at a couple of uh, presentations that she's given, she always asks people about how are we going to turn around poverty. And she asks, uh, what is the the technology that has had the greatest impact on alleviating poverty. And you can see people kind of, you know, scratching their heads and thinking, you know, they'll, they'll come up with something that um, is over in a different field, but she just always surprises people. She says it's family planning and making sure that people have access to care, that it is uh, pregnancy intention. And it goes back to if you want to lift a group of people out of poverty, people can't work, they can't get educated, if they're not healthy. And so where there has been universal health coverage and access, that's where we've seen a dramatic shift in a population's overall growth, development, vitalization. What are the opportunities that you're seeing that um, maybe other people don't because they're not looking at it through your lens or your global perspective? I'm not sure that other people don't see opportunities, but I think it's important to understand that to provide universal health coverage is a complex, a really complex issue. Even if, as you were saying, to provide family planning, which is critically important. Um, and, you know, of course, Melinda Gates is, is absolutely correct, as I would expect her to be. But I would say that you also have to understand that first of all, you need the governance in the health system. So the people in charge of the health system have to be allocating the resources in such a way that there's then um, the workforce to deliver 
what you need to deliver. There's the supplies um, and the pharmacology, the pharma, the, the pharmacy, whenever you need it. Um, and there's also the logistics of getting everything out there to the places it's needed. And that, I think, is an understanding um, that I bring from my previous life to this job in nursing now. And in some ways, you know, it's been a real thrust to get more nurses into the workforce. Ever since I was at WHO, that's been one of the goals. But more nurses in the workforce on its own is not going to solve the problem. Um, and in fact, it's not even going to be a solution because you've got if you train more nurses, you've got to have more teachers, you've got to have more clinical placements so they become competent. Then you've got to keep them in the workforce. So you've got to have salary and incentives to keep them and you've got to place them where they're needed. And all of those issues are tied up with universal health coverage. And that's why we don't have it um, in many, many countries, because we need the governance that can give the oversight to plan those services. And often that's what we don't have. You know, a lot of the solutions are actually very, you can say they're simple solutions, but they're actually very complex when you get right down to it. And I think it's that knowledge of complexity um, that helps me I think to see with other people in this campaign and on my team that we have to have a broad vision, a broad optic to look at how things are going to change and to target policymakers and politicians to also look at this broad optic with regard to nursing. We trip over evidence generated by nurses and have a lot of nurses who can champion that evidence. However, what we don't have are non-nurse champions who will listen to it and present it, you know, to government and to the to the purse holders, to the policy makers. And that's, I think, that's the weak link. So the Nursing Now campaign, can you give a history and an overview and the aims? Sure. So... The campaign started um, in February 2018, and it was started really out of the interests of an all-party parliamentary group in England, which was chaired by Lord Nigel Crisp. And this group um, examined the impact, or the potential impact, really, and the challenges to nursing globally um, in achieving really health for all, uh, universal health coverage. Um, and what the group found in their report, which was called Triple Impact, was that while nursing had this potential triple impact on health, gender equity and economic development, it was often not realised because there was insufficient investment in nursing and that nurses were not allowed often by either by law or by um, regulation in the countries they practiced it, to work to the top of their license, which means they were trained to do things which they were then not allowed to do. Um, and one, uh, you know, that, that was true actually wherever you looked at nursing. So even in the UK, for example, it took years and years for nurses, although they were taught how to do, how to prescribe, to get prescribing rights. Um, if you go to uh, places in uh, lower income countries, um, nurses often have very advanced practice and extended roles, but they have no policy to help them uh, practice in those ways. So the goal of our campaign is to improve health by raising the status and profile of nurses. And what we're aiming to do is to um, get us, well, we have, I think, got a social movement going already. We're already in over 100 countries worldwide. We have over 300 groups now, nursing now groups. And that has just grown exponentially. And I believe that's because there's a real readiness in nursing to step up uh, and really to see what nursing can achieve. So, for example, 
now there's a big movement in Africa to develop the nurse practitioner, advanced nurse practitioner program, um, family nurse practitioners in primary care and specialist nurse practitioners. And those are that's one of our goals is to um, show what advanced nursing practice can achieve around the world with different health populations. We're also working with young nurse leaders um, to try to change the perception that nursing is women's work, um, should be, you know, it's just women's work, anybody can do it, it's not very sophisticated. We really want to get this message out there that nursing is highly sophisticated, complex, um, and can really meet many health needs. All health needs will only be met in a team, but nurses can lead those teams. And so we're trying to develop leadership skills uh, across the board through our partners, ICN, WHO, other partners here, um, and develop young nurses, which we're doing through the Nightingale Challenge next year, which is a challenge to employers of nurses to put 20 young nurses through a leadership development program that will help them see how nursing should interact with policy and policy makers so that nurses are at the policy making um, decision or in the policy making decision making rooms, which they're currently not. And, you know, we believe nurses should be at every high level discussion, every talking heads program about health that's on the tally. Nurses should be in those programs, and currently they're not. They're almost invisible in many countries. So our quest is to raise the visibility of nurses so that um, they can contribute fully to improving global health. You're listening to See You Now. I'm your host, Shauna Butler. We're talking with Barbara Stilwell, the Executive Director of Nursing Now, Nursing Now is run in collaboration with the World Health Organization and ICN, the International Council of Nurses, and aims to improve health by raising the profile and status of nursing worldwide. Barbara mentioned that the number of Nursing Now groups is growing exponentially. And just to give you a sense of what she means, we're now into February of 2020, and the number of groups has almost doubled since we spoke with her in October of 2019. And over 600 employers in 66 countries have accepted the Nightingale Challenge, enrolling almost 26,000 nurses in leadership development programs. And like she said, this is not happening without cooperation and collaboration. By partnering with ICN, the federation of more than 130 National Nurses Association that represents over 20 million nurses worldwide, Nursing Now is poised to make real headway particularly by focusing on the leadership development of young nurses and largely because of the work of this type of quantum collaboration. But will it be enough? Let's get back to our conversation. This is See You Now, and I'm Shauna Butler. So the Nursing Now campaign, it is addressing the urgency because there is a uh, looming shortage that we are not going to get around just because of the aging demographics and the demand and need. There is raising the visibility of what nurses do, what they have done, and what they can do. And it is putting nurses in policy and leadership roles at all levels such that the health and the health delivery and the health outcomes of populations can be dramatically improved. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. And we, do, we want leadership at all levels. Yes, we do. But we also do want to see leadership at the top levels too, and real leadership, not people put in positions with no budget uh, and no staff. Yeah. When people say nurses need a voice at the table, my response has been, we have a voice. What we don't have is a budget, influence, decision-making, and accountability. Yes. And exactly. And those, yes. those are the game changers. They're the game changers. Exactly, they are. And we did a big survey um, last year, two and a half thousand nurses around the world um, with the support of Johnson & Johnson and Intrahealth International. And this is exactly what we found. 
nurses said, you know, I could really be successful in a senior leadership role if I had budgetary discretion. And it's the old, old story that you put somebody in a leadership position because you have to, you know, because somebody says there's no women or there's no nurses. So you put them in the leadership position, but you don't give them a budget or an adequate budget and you don't give them any staff. So at the end of two years, you say, well, what have they done? Nothing. See, I told you we didn't need one. And you very close to that report. Can you comment on that? What what was your takeaway? Actually, it was interesting, that report. I came away. I, I expected to see the gender issue um, really at the top of the reasons why nurses didn't feel they could progress in leadership and it wasn't at the top it was more these practical things like I need the equipment and I need the budget and you know I I need an enabling environment to enable me to be a leader however having said that um, there are really critically important gender issues which you know you're right it's very difficult to talk about them Um, um, because it sounds like we've put on this old broken record, you know, oh, it's just because we're women, we can't get on. But if you look at the results of what our study and what people said, it's and, and also the results of other studies, I mean, it's not just our studies, other studies will lend weight to this. There is this glass escalator, you know, that takes men to the top. And part of the reason for that is because women are seen as having family responsibilities. And in fact, they do have family responsibilities. So what we're really talking about, you know, is a very big shift in the ways that women and men think about their roles and their responsibilities. And really, nursing should be representative of the population. So it should be 50% men, 50% women, and all the other, you know, diversities that are in populations, Um, but it never, ever has been because nursing is seen as women's work. And that is still very detrimental. Uh, And, and, you know, what I've noticed is that, you know, people like ministers of health, they step up to the podium and they say, I love nurses. I have a sister who's a nurse. She's wonderful. You know, she's a wonderful woman. None of them have ever said, I have a brother who's a nurse yet um, or a father Um, and so we you know we need to move beyond the oh aren't they wonderful um, scenario to investing in nursing can bring you a return on your investment in the following ways Um, and you know we haven't really got that conversation going. You wrote Uh, a remarkable editorial, Breaking the Silence, A New Story of Nursing. And you addressed that so well. Um, I think it was back in early 2018 that you wrote that. It seems timeless, and um, it tells the story that's been happening for decades, maybe even centuries, around the understanding or the perception of nursing and women's work. Now that the campaign is underway, is there, is, is any of this changed? Is there, um, are we making progress? Um, if you were to rewrite this, what would you write differently? I'm not sure you could yet write anything truly differently, to be honest. Um, however, I think I would add in that um, we need, as nurses, one, I, I, the gender question is undoubtedly um, of critical importance. And, you know, we talked about the Me Too movement in that breaking the silence. And I do believe that it is the sort of, um, it is the, the, the synchronicity of the Me Too movement and nursing now in many ways has driven nursing now. I also have come to see over the last 18 months that nurses are not nearly political enough. Um, You know, they have an image of being nice and that tends to play out in the way that nurses are. And 
that, you know, nurses are not politically astute. So somehow don't develop the political language to make the cases, you know, that they're that that they need to make to politicians about investing in nursing. And I've been reading quite a lot of Mary Beard recently about women and voice. And I realise that nurses are seen as as complaining, <laughs> whiny <laughs> women. You know, they're, they're not seen as making a point, which men would be seen doing. You know, if these were male doctors, they'd be listened to. They'd be on the radio have, making a point. But nurses are seen as whinging. Um, and I'm very struck that Mary Beard points this out time and again about women of voice, that when women make a complaint, it's seen as, you know, whinging and they need patting on the head. Yeah, I was having a conversation with a couple of nurse researchers about this, and they made the observation, nurses are very, very, very good about identifying problems. So they lead oh. with the problem, and that may be part of the perception of why there is a higher rate of complaining rather than uh, putting forward solutions. Thinking about what you mentioned earlier about access to care in relationship to what problems nurses are identifying, um, the, well, the other part of that enablement and building workforce capacity is using technology to remove the geographic boundedness using something like an AI or a chatbot mm -hmm. or virtual care. Uh, there are so many new possibilities, and what that requires is a regulatory framework and a system that is designed to reflect how we've progressed as a civilization with our science and our technology. And it sounds like at Nursing Now and this movement with all of these different clusters and hives of activity, nurses are really thinking about how to meet people and deliver the care where it's needed in new and different and I think really exciting ways. Mm. I think that's true, Shauna. And I think particularly among young nurses who they're the ones that really realize the potential of technology and the, you know, what having a platform of connectedness can do um, for you. But I think, you know, there are exciting developments in pockets in many places, um, but they're not, they're not being rolled out as rapidly as perhaps they could, I think. What is your thought about curriculum evolving. When we think about how we're preparing all of our health professions, what are some of the innovations that need to happen at the curriculum level so that the caring professions that we are training today are prepared for the situations we have yet to imagine? We have to be, as a profession, I feel, we have to be building our curricula in a way that allows the maximum flexibility. And we should be going for the guy by the side, not sage on the stage model. So it's a, I think it's a case of having many more demonstrations of how things can be different and how they look and how they work. You know, when I look back on my training, which was, you know, when Abraham was a lad, <laughs> um, it was a long, long time ago. The dinosaurs were walking the earth at that point. <laughs> they certainly were. We were putting bandages on their legs. Um, no, it was a long time ago. And, to, you know, that is a phrase I use sometimes in just talking about the world, really, then and now, is I could not have imagined what this world today would have looked like when I was training as a nurse. And, you know, yet that has a wonderful possibility because if you can only imagine it, it might actually come to happen, you know, come to be. And if I could really reform nursing curricula, I would put a politics module in it um, about, you know, the importance of politics and policy and economics. When I read the Triple Impact Report, one of my favorite lines in here is, much of what is said here will be familiar to nursing leaders, but they alone cannot bring about the changes that are needed. Politicians, non-nursing health leaders, and others must work with them to create radical changes in how nurses are perceived and in what they are permitted and enabled to do. So who are those nurse champions, 
politicians, economists? Who are they? Well, um, we have identified a number of nurse champions and non-nurse champions for nursing now. I think, you know, we have a lot of really, in nursing, in the profession, really smart nurses. I mean, really beyond smart, some of them, just amazing. Um, you know, our um, deputy chair of our um, a board is um, Sheila Clow from South Africa, Botswana, and she's um, and she's fantastic. She was a minister of health. She's a wonderful champion for nurses. Um, and we have, you know, so many, especially in the USA, so many nurse academics who who really understand, you know, the the number of nurses that are needed to provide good care. I think, you know, we need champions. <laughs> we need champions in all of the uh, areas you're talking about. We need, we definitely need economics champions. We need to show the return on investment the way they did in, you know, the UN report on investing in the health workforce. Um, we need one of those. I'm hoping State of the World's Nursing will bring that um, that dimension to show. Um, you know, that that nursing is a good investment, that there is a return on that investment, as well as uh, good health care, employment. Um, we have some uh, champions like uh, Professor Srinath Reddy from India. He's one of our champions, um, as is Atoll Gwande. So, we, you know, we have champions from outside the profession. What we need to do is to get all of us, them and us, talking more in, a, in a smarter way about what nurses and nursing can bring to the health system. And the strongest nurse champions are the ones, I think, who move outside nursing into either politics or some sort of other uh, arena, you know. So uh, in our, on our board, we have Baroness Mary Watkins of Tavistock, who was a mental health nurse, but was also a vice chancellor of a university and is now in the House of Lords. And so she talks politically. And I think that's really important. To me, that's our weak link. Um, so you're in full support of my admonition when I tell nurses start going to the technology and policy conferences. Go to the <laughs> forbidden places. Yes. Go to the places where you're new and novel and you're sharing an insight that people in housing or law enforcement or food systems uh, or data science are not familiar with. Absolutely. And, you know, the only people who do that is the people like prison nurses or forensic nurses. Um who are with teams that are predominantly not nurses. So they really make their presence felt. But interestingly, those are the people who are largely silent in the nursing arena. So, you know, what we've tried to do is provide a platform to bring these diverse groups together so they can talk to each other. Yeah, in the, uh, the you mentioned that there are nursing now groups in over 100 countries. What are these groups doing? Well, they've all got their own um, agendas, you know, their own um, things they want to accomplish by being a nursing now group. So, um, for example, in Jamaica, they're working on gender based violence because it's a huge problem in um, Northern Ireland. They're working on men nursing and homelessness because they're two big issues for them. Uh, in the UK, they're working on the image of nursing, trying to change this sort of feminine, you know, women's work image of nursing. So, you know, depending on where you are, they, 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 each country has its own agenda. Uh, and some of them are really ambitious. Mexico has a very ambitious agenda of what it wants to do. It wants to put 350,000 young nurses on the Nightingale Challenge. Which is great for us. We've met our met our um, results right there. 
I love reading through all of the Nursing Now groups on their social um, feeds. And I look at that as this rich source of ideas. In England, the CNO role where nurses go into different schools in the primary schools, and they have team CNO, and they're encouraging young students to pursue becoming a chief nursing officer. And so they go in, they explain and share with them this vast range of experiences that are available to nurses in all the different ways that they can have impact in their community and country and and globe and then put them in their scrubs and they create the team CNO. I just love that. And every time I go into the social feeds to see what they're doing in Sweden or in Australia or with the midwifery groups or pediatric nurses, it's just bubbling with it is great ideas. And so for me, when I, when I, when I've encouraged other groups to join and form, they'll say, well, why is it because you don't have to reinvent the wheel? Somebody else is already (laughs) doing it. You just go and take their template or you amplify it or join it. Um, So what's your pitch to people uh, or nursing groups to join nursing now? Well, we, um, what what we tell them is how successful nursing now groups are at bringing together the diverse pe- players, the stakeholders in the country. So you can't start a nursing now group unless you have a professional association, chief nursing officer, education, WHO if it's in your country, young nurses and non-nurses. All those people have to be in the group before um, it can be approved as a group. So what it's done is it's created a platform for all of these nurses to start talking to each other. We give them the opportunity to post their photos and talk about their work, um, write a blog if they want to. So, you know, what we're trying to do is to really make that global platform an open platform for everybody. Um, And we're going to do that with the young nurses, too, with these 20,000 young nurses next year allow them to be linked to each other wherever they are. Nursing now is the first opportunity nurses have had to really create a social movement. And I think it's been possible because of social media. Um, And if you think about, you know, times when nurses have, not there have been many, but times when nurses' voices have been heard, it's tended to be small group or individuals. Um, But we've actually reached, you know, the second stage of a social movement. We've kind of got organized and we've got communication between groups. So in my view, 2020 is going to be a once in a lifetime, certainly for me, opportunity um, for nurses to really look for a different future together. So I'm, you know, that's what drives me forward with this campaign, I think we can really make substantive change in 2020. That is brilliant. And count me in, um, call on me, and I will be there standing at your side. (laughs) I will, (laughs) Shauna. Barbara Stilwell is the Executive Director of the Nursing Now Global Campaign. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. See You Now is created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. To learn more about these programs and See You Now, visit seeyounowpodcast.com. Check out our show notes for more resources and be sure to subscribe to See You Now wherever you get podcasts.